Hello, and welcome to Lecture 4 of Energy Fundamentals in Phys 2104. In this video, we're going to look at irreversibility, and in particular, why processes can be irreversible. And this is going to lead us to the second law of thermodynamics. We have seen over and over again that processes seem to prefer increases in thermal energy. So, for example, if you start off with a pendulum swinging, then it's going to slow down and eventually stop. And this is because it interacts with the air around it, and the air warms up slightly, and so the atoms in the air will be moving slightly faster. This is the direction that this process always happens. The reverse process, where the air spontaneously cools down and sets the pendulum in motion, never happens. So this is sometimes called the arrow of time. There are forward processes which happen, and reverse ones which never happen. But now think about the atomic scale. If you have two atoms coming at each other at speeds v1 and v2, and they collide and end up going at v3 and v4, think about how you would have solved this collision back in an earlier course. You would have used conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And if you start with the unknowns v3 and v4 and the knowns v1 and v2, you can solve this. But the reverse is true. If they had started coming at each other at v3 and v4, and you solve the exact same equations, you're bound to get v1 and v2 as the final speeds. Which means that that is just the reverse. The original collision played backwards. These dynamics are time reversible. And that's true. Fundamental mechanics, including quantum mechanics, has a time reversal symmetry. But this makes it rather mysterious why on our scale we get things like eggs falling on the floor that's clearly irreversible, even though the underlying mechanics on the atomic scale is reversible. To think about this, we need some new terminology. Let's think about a box of gas, and it has some pressure, volume, and temperature. But hopefully you recognize that it could have the same pressure, volume, and temperature, but the atoms inside it could be in different places moving at different speeds. In fact, there are many, 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 many possibilities for how the atoms in the box could be moving at any instant, which would all share the same pressure, volume, and temperature. The pressure, volume, and temperature is called the macro state. These are macroscopic variables that we can measure in the lab, whereas the set of values for all of the positions and velocities of the atoms in the box are referred to as the microstates of this macrostate. These are the microstates that correspond to this macrostate. And even for a modest-sized box of gas, the number of possible microstates is staggeringly huge. So big that if I could somehow draw a picture of each microstate on every electron in the visible universe, I would run out of electrons in the visible universe before I could draw all of the microstates. Learning how to find out how many microstates a box of gas would have is way beyond what we can do in this course, but I'm going to give you a flavor for it with something much simpler. Let's think about flipping coins. So, suppose we have four coins, a quarter, a dime, a nickel, and a penny, and we flip them all. What we'll describe as the macrostate of this system of coins is how many heads are showing but the microstate will be the listing of what face is showing on each coin, and I'll order them in the order quarter, dime, nickel, penny. So, for example, the macrostate of zero heads has only one corresponding microstate, because all of the coins are tails up, whereas the macrostate of one head has four microstates. The quarter could be heads up, the dime, or the nickel, or the penny. Let's check that you're following the argument and understand the terminology. So consider this system of four coins, and let's think about the macrostate corresponding to two heads. How many microstates does this macrostate correspond to? 